Good afternoon. My name is Eva Feldman, and I'm director of the Neuro Network for Emerging Therapies. Welcome to our mini symposium series. Today's mini symposium is entitled, Here Comes the Sun. We will take questions and answers at the end of our three talks. Please use the Q&A function. Now, today I'm going to discuss how the sun affects brain health. First, I'm going to describe how the sun regulates our body's circadian clocks and rhythms, then explain how the sun affects sleep-wake cycles, and then discuss the impact of the sun on vitamin D, dopamine, and serotonin activity and levels. Now, we each have a circadian clock, and at 6.30 in the morning, we have our biggest rise in our blood pressure. At 7.30, melatonin is no longer secreted. We're most alert at 10 a.m., most coordinated at 2.30 in the afternoon. By 5 p.m., we have our greatest cardiovascular output and muscle strength. Our body temperature is highest at 7 p.m., and once the sun sets, melatonin is secreted throughout the night. At 2 a.m., we're in our deepest sleep, and at 4.30 in the morning, we're at our lowest body temperature. Now, the sun regulates the circadian clock through a circadian control system center in the brain. And what occurs is that your retina senses sunlight, and that sensation is transmitted in the brain through what's known as the retinal hypothalamic tract to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And this is the master clock in the brain. This small nucleus either makes hormones itself or makes connections in the brain to other parts of the brain which make hormones, which regulate your entire circadian rhythm. And each tissue in your body has its own circadian clock regulated by this master clock. This Master clock regulates melatonin, which affects our sleep-wake cycles. It regulates hormones that affect glucose, insulin, stimulated activity, which affects your metabolism. And it also affects our cardiovascular system, our immune system, and a suite of other biological functions. Now, the sleep-wake cycle begins upon dark when melatonin is secreted at night, then throughout the evening but there are factors that disturb the sleep-wake cycle. Nicotine, caffeine, and sugar are all stimulants, which particularly if taken in the afternoon will stimulate areas in the brain that melatonin works to decrease their activity, but now they're overstimulated by these stimulants. And also importantly, bright light during the dark hours will block melatonin secretion, which of course will disturb your sleep-wake cycle. Now, the sun also affects brain health through vitamin D. As we know, so there are forms of cholesterol that are converted from, to pre-vitamin D into vitamin D in the skin when the skin observes or you know, is exposed to sun. And vitamin D is very important for calcium absorption, bone mineralization, muscle strength, and immune function. I think we all know that. But what we don't know is how important vitamin D is for brain health. And vitamin D deficiencies affect brain development, how the neural circuitry in the brain operates. It causes sleep disorders, psychiatric disorders, and can even cause frank dementia. Finally, the sun has clear benefits through two neurotransmitters, the chemical messengers in the brain, dopamine and serotonin. Now these transmitters transmit what I'll call feel good signals in the brain. They improve, improve your cognition, your mood and your sleep. And they also coordinate brain body function. And what is known is the spending time outdoors exposed to sunlight improves brain health in part also by increasing serotonin and dopamine levels. And particularly, if you can exercise outside, you get the double hit of both the benefits of increased dopamine and serotonin from exercise coupled with exposure to sun. So in summary, 
the sun regulates circadian rhythms and normal body functions via this master clock in the brain that's very responsive to sunlight. The sun through melatonin normalizes sleep cycles and you should clearly avoid stimulants, especially in the afternoon and evening because that disrupts the melatonin's ability to regulate your sleep cycle. And the sun also enhances levels and activity of vitamin D, which is required for normal brain function, and also the good mood molecules of serotonin and dopamine. I'd now like to turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Leslie Swanson from the Department of Psychiatry and the Eisenberg Depression Center, who will speak to you on the sun and seasonal affective disorder. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Feldman, and hello, everyone. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the Eisenbergs for their support of my research through the Depression Center over the years. It's much appreciated. Today, I'm going to introduce you to seasonal affective disorder, discuss how light impacts mood, and review how to use light therapy for depression. What is seasonal affective disorder? It's actually a subtype of depression that's marked by the same symptoms as major depressive disorder, such as low mood, loss of interest or pleasure, feelings of guilt, worthlessness and hopelessness, and low energy or fatigue. But these mood symptoms are only present during specific times of the year. In most cases, this is across the fall into the winter. In order to be diagnosed with seasonal affective disorder, you have to have had two consecutive years of mood symptoms in that specific season with full recovery or remission during the other parts of the year. There are some symptoms that are unique to seasonal affect, affective disorder. We call these atypical symptoms. These include things like sleeping more than normal, having cravings for carbohydrates and sweets, usually accompanied by an increased appetite, increased food intake, and related weight gain. We also sometimes see extreme fatigue in seasonal affective disorder. About 10 to 20% of people with major depressive disorder suffer from the seasonal affective disorder subtype with rates of up to about 2.5% in the general population. We don't know the exact causes of seasonal affective disorder, but we have some suspects. First is the disruption of the light signaling pathways in the brain, which can lead to less available serotonin, especially when the days are shorter. Relatedly, we see that circadian rhythms, or our body clock, if you will, often run too late, but sometimes too early relative to the sleep-wake cycle in seasonal affective disorder, again, likely influenced by the shorter day length. Finally, we know that family history is a risk factor and emerging evidence suggests that there are specific genes that may contribute to risk. There are several different treatment options for seasonal affective disorder. The two that have the most robust evidence base are light therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy for depression. Medications can be helpful as well. Today, I'm gonna to be focusing on light therapy. I also want to mention here that light therapy is an effective treatment for non-seasonal depression as well. In fact, I have an ongoing research study on light therapy for postpartum depression. The use of sunlight as therapy is one of the most ancient therapeutic practices. In fact, Hippocrates wrote about sun therapy. The ancient Greeks and Romans built healing temples with light rooms for sunbathing. And there's a Persian proverb that says, when you shut out the sun from coming through the window, the doctor comes through the door. Dr. Feldman has already spoken about this. So I will just briefly mention here again that light acts as an antidepressant in multiple ways. Now I'm gonna focus on the practical aspects of light therapy. Historically, the sun has been used as a major source of light therapy, but in many places, for example, Michigan in the fall and the winter, there's not enough sunlight early enough in the morning to be used as an effective therapy for depression. Because of this, we've invented light boxes. 
And these are probably the devices that come to mind for most people when they think about light therapy. With light boxes, you sit a few feet away from the box while you're doing something else like reading or eating breakfast. More recently, technological advances have brought us wearable light therapy devices, such as light therapy glasses. And I have a pair here that I'm gonna show you. And these glasses have LEDs in the bottom that have uh, project bioactive light upwards into the eyes. And they have the advantage of allowing the user to be fully mobile and to engage in multiple activities while they're receiving treatment. I'm actually testing these glasses right now in my study of light therapy for postpartum depression. Regardless of the device that you choose, there are a few tips to keep in mind to maximize your treatment response. Data show that light therapy is most effective when it's used very close to your wake time and at the same time every day. So you wanna set a specific time to wake up every day, seven days per week, and plan to start the light as close to your scheduled wake time as possible. Aim for 30 minutes of light. You can adjust this down to 15 minutes or up to 60 minutes, depending on your response. In my treatment study, our participants are using the light for 60 minutes. You can also use light therapy throughout the day if you feel sleepy or less alert, but don't use it in the evening because it can cause sleep problems if you use it too late into the day. Usually we see that light therapy will start to have a positive uh, impact on your mood within the first 10 to 14 days of use. Some things to keep in mind when you're selecting a light therapy device. If you're using a box, find one that has at least 10,000 lux. This is the same as natural light 40 minutes after the sun rises. If you're using light glasses, you wanna find a pair that projects light upwards towards your eyes. If you use uh, something that projects, projects light downwards, like a light visor, some of that light might be blocked by your periorbital ridge, which is the part of your face here. Most devices use broad spectrum light, which is effective, but there is some newer evidence suggesting that blue-green wavelength has more robust impacts on the body clock. I do want you to know that light therapy can have side effects. Most of the time, I see that these go away on their own after about two weeks of continued use as the brain gets used to the increased light. Most commonly, I see headaches and irritability in my patients, but there is a rare and serious side effect uh, of involving bipolar disorder in which light therapy can worsen bipolar disorder. In general, you can adjust the length of time that you're using the light and the brightness of the light if you do have side effects to see if that helps. Finally, there are some reasons why you shouldn't use light therapy or talk to your doctor before you start it. These include things like eye disease uh, that affects the retina, photosensitizing medications or photosensitivity, seizures, and a history of bipolar disorder. As I wrap up, I want to mention that the Center for Environmental Therapeutics at CET.org is an excellent source of information about how to use light therapy. Our next speaker is Dr. Kelly Harms from the Department of Dermatology, who will be telling you about sun exposure and your skin. Thank you, Dr. Swanson. So I'm Kelly Harms. I'm the Chief of the Division of Cutaneous Surgery and Oncology, and I serve as the Director of the Multidisciplinary Cutaneous Oncology Program here at U of M. Um, I would first like to thank Dr. Feldman for the opportunity to be here today and for you for joining us. Today, I'll be talking about the do's and don'ts of sun exposure in your skin. As a brief overview, we'll talk about sun exposure and ultraviolet light, ultraviolet light and skin cancer, and how you can protect your skin from the sun. Here you can see a partial schema of the electromagnetic spectrum showing visible light and ultraviolet light. In particular, UVA radiation has a wavelength of 400 to 320 nanometers and can be associated with skin tanning, UVB radiation has a wavelength of 320 to 290 nanometers and can be associated with sunburns. Now we care about UVA and UVB radiation because these wavelengths of light can pass through the ozone layer, contact our skin and cause DNA damage. More specifically, UVA radiation can cause oxidative DNA stress. UVB radiation can directly damage DNA by causing pyrimidine dimers. 
If unrepaired, the pyrimidine dimers can result in DNA damage, and if the damage is in, within certain genes or a combination of genes, can result in skin cancer. Here I would like to show you some skin cancer statistics published by the Skin Cancer Foundation. One in five Americans will develop skin cancer by the age of 70. Five or more sunburns can increase your risk of melanoma. The most common skin cancer diagnosed is basal cell carcinoma with 3.6 million diagnosed per year. The second most common is squamous cell carcinoma with 1.8 million diagnosed per year. And as for melanomas, it's projected that there are about 186,000 melanomas to be diagnosed in 2023. We know that the most common types of skin cancer are associated with UV radiation. But what about more rare types of skin cancer? Here at the University of Michigan, through the cutaneous oncology program, we do coordinate care for patients diagnosed with a rare type of cancer called Merkel cell carcinoma. This is a very rare cancer with only about 3,000 cases projected to be diagnosed in the United States in 2023. This was originally described in 1972 on sun-exposed sites. Because of the rarity of the cancer, little was known about Merkel cell carcinoma until about 2008. At that time, it was discovered that viral DNA was associated in MCC tumors, later termed the Merkel cell polyomavirus. Here at U of M, we've looked at both UV and polyomavirus media pathways of Merkel cell carcinoma. Here you can see some research from 2015 from the Department of Pathology with Paul Harms and Arul Chanayan. What they did was they looked at many Merkel cell tumors and they sequenced the DNA. What you can see here is that a vast number of DNA mutations were identified in viral negative Merkel cell tumors, whereas very, far, very few mutations were identified in viral positive tumors. If we look more closely at these tumor mutations, we found that these were associated with ultraviolet light or demonstrated the UV signature, showing a link between ultraviolet light and MCC tumors arising in the viral negative pathway. Here at U of M, in the Department of Dermatology, both Anne Delugos and Monique Verhagen have looked very closely and made significant strides in understanding how the virus associates with um, MCC tumors. Now we know about um, sun exposure, ultraviolet lights, and skin cancers. How can you protect your skin from the sun? But first you need to know where you're exposed to the sun. You can be exposed on a sunny day with UVA and UVB, you can be exposed to ultraviolet light on cloudy days. We know that UVA passes through clouds, whereas UVB is partly blocked. You can be exposed through window glass. We know that glass blocks UVB, but UVA can filter through window glass. You're also exposed to UV through your car. Car windshields block both UVA and UVB, but you can still have UVA through the side and the rear windows in your car. You're also exposed through ultraviolet light through reflection. We know that snow can reflect 85 to 90% of ultraviolet light. Water can reflect 15 to 25% of ultraviolet light. Sand can reflect up to 15%. And dark soil and vegetation can reflect up to 10 to 20% of ultraviolet light. So if you're on the ski slopes and you haven't used sun protection, you can have almost, the, almost doubled ultraviolet, ultraviolet exposure. So how can you protect your skin from UV, UV radiation or the sun? First, you want to avoid indoor tanning. Also seek shade. Avoid sun during peak intense hours between the hours of 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And also sun protection with sunscreens and protective clothing. Let's talk a little bit more about sunscreens. What's the difference between sunscreens and sunblock? Sunblock shield your skin from UVA and UVB radiation with the physical blockers of zinc oxide and or titanium dioxide. Sunscreens contain chemicals that absorb and scatter UV rays. What does broad spectrum mean? Broad spectrum means that these sunscreens or sunblocks protect against both UVA and UVB rays. What about SPF or sun protective factor? SPF is the amount of protection that you have from a sunburn. So for example, if it takes you 10 minutes to burn without sunscreen, if you use an SPF of 30, it'll be 30 times that, or 300 minutes to burn when using an SPF of 30. What about water resistance? Sunscreens are also labeled as water resistant. 
If it's water resistant, it can protect you against 40 minutes in the water or very water resistant protects against 80 minutes in the water. So now we know the different descriptions of sunscreens. How do you apply them? Sunscreens need to be applied about 15 to 20 minutes before going outdoors. Sunblocks are active when you, when you apply them. If you use a sunscreen spray, it should be rubbed in when applied. How much do you need? Sunscreens are tested at two micrograms per centimeter squared. Importantly, if you want the protection that you expect, you should apply them and how they're tested. A good rule of thumb is to apply one ounce um, to all of your skin. Here you can see a measuring cup. One ounce will be to the top of that measuring cup. How often do you need to reapply? Plan to reapply every one to two hours in direct sunlight, after swimming, sweating, or toweling off. And don't forget your eyes, lips, and feet. Remember to wear sunglasses, lip balm with SPF, and make sure you protect your feet, if you're, especially when you're wearing sandals. In terms of covering up, there are many different types of sun protection that we recommend. We recommend hats with a wide-brimmed hat and a tight weave. I always recommend the hat covers your ears and your neck. I always recommend you hold your hat up to the light. If you can see the light, the sun can see you. In terms of clothing, recommend a tight weave fabric without holes. And some clothing has a UPF label or a UV protective factor. And what does this measure? This measures the fraction of sun's UV rays that penetrate the fabric. So for example, a UPF of 50 allows 1 50th of UV radiation to reach the skin. Now we know about ultraviolet light and, and skin cancer and how to protect your skin from the sun. How can you detect skin cancers early? I recommend self-skin exams monthly at home and self-exams, skin exams by your care team. Here you can see a figure published by the American Cancer Society to give you a systematic way to evaluate your skin at home. For more information on skin cancer and sun protection, please see the American Academy of Dermatology, the Skin Cancer Foundation, and the American Cancer Society. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions. Hello, uh, wonderful talks. We have many, many questions, so I think I'll just jump right in. Um, and let's start with uh, you, Dr. Harm, since you just spoke, and wonderful talk, Kelly. Um, I'm going to lump a few questions together, and that would be, uh, let's talk about the best sunscreen. So what is the best sunscreen for children and for adults? And in terms of SPF, you certainly described it well. Is there a particular SPF that you recommend children and adults? Thank you. Great, Dr. Feldman, thank you so much. That's a really, really great question. It can often be very confusing. So the best sunscreens really are broad spectrum that will have both UVA and UVB protection. You wanna look for an SPF of 30 or higher as well as water resistance. Now, if that is for when you're going outdoors, you wanna make sure you reapply every couple of hours. Now, in terms of different age groups, um, babies under the age of six months, um, the American Academy of Dermatology and the American Academy of Pediatrics does recommend um, sun protection using um, clothing and hats and seeking shade. Um, we do recommend that if there are areas where the skin will be unprotected by clothing that you are able to apply sunscreen in small amounts as we really want to prevent um, sunburns in babies and those under six months of age. Um, for children six months of age and higher, you want to consider looking for a sunscreen that is um, made for children, these often will contain the physical blockers of the sun, um, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. These products can be less irritating to the skin, um, and they're also been deemed as generally recognized as safe and effective by the um, FDA um, for kids. Um, for adults, again, looking for the SPF 30 or higher um, really are the, are the best types of sunscreens um, to look for. Okay, thank you. So we're getting some practical recommendations. So Dr. Swanson, I think I'll just ask you a question. So I loved your light glasses. This is my editorial, but how effective are these light glasses? Exactly. And like type, lux, placement, proximity. You did talk a little bit about that, but would you like to give us kind of some facts to make, I'll say rubber hit the road on using them? 
Yes. So I'm actually using light therapy right now as we speak with the glasses. So you can see that it does enable you to engage in a variety of activities while you're receiving light therapy. So these are the glasses. And I also know uh, sometimes people want to use a more traditional light therapy a device like a lamp or a box and both the glasses and a light therapy lamp are as effective as an antidepressant or talk therapy for both seasonal affective disorder and major depressive disorder so they're they're quite effective and they can be used as standalone treatments or they can be used in conjunction with an antidepressant medication or talk therapy if you're thinking about using a light therapy lamp uh, in terms of the size, you want to look for a box that's about 200 square inches. The larger, the better, because it's going to cover more of your face with light. The issue with smaller size lamps or boxes is that even small head movements are going to reduce the dose of the light that you're getting. Um, and again, for uh, light therapy lamps or boxes, you're going to sit about 12 inches away, about arm's length away from the box, not look directly at the box, but keep it in your field of vision. Usually you'll angle it downwards a little bit to minimize glare. Okay, thank you. I like the look too. <laughs> okay, I'll, t I'll take a question that which actually will segue to another question for you, Dr. Swanson. So there are several questions about vitamin D supplementation. So, uh, and, and how much sunlight and what about supplements and how much vitamin D we need. So the, uh, so the daily recommended dosage of vitamin D3 is 600 international units. You can get vitamin D pills. I'm sure many of you have seen D3 pills. And we would suggest you take pills that are maybe 1,000 to 2,000 international units, but not more. Some manufacturers make pills that are even greater, like 4,000 international units, and those are actually toxic. So you want to keep, if you're going to take a daily vitamin D supplementation, that is what you would like to do, 1,000 to 2,000 international units a day. Secondly, in terms of how much sun one would need if you wanted to use natural sun exposure rather than vitamin D therapy, between 15 minutes and 30 minutes of sun exposure three times a week during the hours where Dr. Harms tells us we maybe should not be out in the sun, and that is between 10 in the morning and four in the afternoon, has shown to be most effective. Also, I should note that there are lots of foods that are high in vitamin D3. They're kind of the foods one thinks about, again, with the Mediterranean diet, avocados, salmons, and almonds. So there are many ways to get vitamin D3. And Dr. Swanson, a question for you. Um, what are your thoughts on vitamin D supplementation in regards to like mental health and mood? So I think the role of vitamin D in depression is a relatively new frontier in psychiatry, and I hope it's an area that we continue to do more work in because I think it's promising. There is some evidence to support the use of vitamin D supplementation to improve depression symptoms in people who are known to be deficient in vitamin D. I also think it can be particularly useful as an augmentation strategy, so using it in conjunction with an antidepressant medication or light therapy, for example. If you're thinking about um, taking uh, vitamin D to improve your depression, I think a good first step is to get your levels checked by your doctor to see if you are deficient. And if you are, then start a supplement in the range that you mentioned, Dr. Feldman. Uh, in the depression literature, we see the 1,000 international units um, per day being mentioned, and then getting your levels rechecked in a few months to see uh, what they Excellent. look like. Excellent. So Dr. Harms, back to you for a couple of rapid fire questions. There are many questions for you. Uh, let's start about, let's start with sunglasses. What sunglasses are most protective? What sunglasses should I buy? Yeah, that's a really great question. And so um, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, they do recommend 100% um, um, UVA or UVB uh, blockers or looking for a UV 400 signature on the sunglasses. The other thing that you want to look for are sun, the larger, the better in terms of the lens. And so you may even consider a wraparound sunglass um, that will protect the UV light from the sides. These also protect your eyes from wind, um, sand, um, and other debris as well. Um, and then if you're thinking about um, playing sports with your sunglasses, you know, a polycarbonate um, 
material it has the is the best in terms of um, shatterproof. Um, the FDA does regulate sunglasses in terms of impact, and so many of them are they are regulated by the FDA. But thinking about what you're used for those. Okay, I'm going to ask you two other quick questions. One is how can fair skin individuals who easily burn get the benefits of sun exposure safely? Yep, that's a really, really good question. And so dermatologists often do recommend sunscreen daily. Any type of, you know, turning your skin turning pink or any little bit of, of um, scaling from the sun exposure would be classified as a sunburn. And so we do recommend dermatologists do recommend daily sunscreens to prevent those those sunburns, especially in, in fair skin folks, folks um, for risk of skin cancer as well as early photo aging as well. And so I think dermatologists often recommend supplementation with foods and uh, making sure that you do have your blood levels checked to make sure that you're not deficient. Uh, and I guess this will be our, our time is up, but I need to ask this one last question because it's actually been asked by many individuals. Is there any documented evidence for harm from you know, current sunblock, sunblock lotions? There has been a lot of popular press about that, and we'd really like to get your opinion on that. Absolutely. It's a really important question. We know that sunscreens save our skin from sunburns and skin cancer, but what about harm from the sun, the sunscreens that we are applying? I think about three different categories of, of this concept. One are chemical contaminants. Um, in 2021 of May, it was found that benzene was identified as a contaminant in sunscreen products. Benzene is a known carcinogen. Um, Valisher is a company that did evaluate many different sunscreens and report which sunscreens contained the contaminant. Um, these sunscreens have been removed from the market. The second is environmental harm. There are two sunscreen components, um, oxybenzone and octanosate, have that have been banned in Hawaii as well as Key West um, for concerns over effects on um, marine ecosystems. And so if you look at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric um, 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 administration, there are recommendations on different um, sunscreens and some protection that may be more safe for marine ecosystems. And then we really wanna think about harm to humans and are there any associated documented Harm to humans. Importantly, F the FDA does regulate sunscreens as an over-the-counter medication. In 2019 and 2020, it was recently shown that um, the blood levels of sunscreens in your body can exceed a concentration of 0.5 nanograms per milliliter. That's the threshold that the FDA recommends that further testing is done to determine if these chemicals are safe. And so um, there are three categories. The first is GRACE, generally recognized as safe and effective, and both the physical blockers of the sun, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide have been deemed as GRACE. Um, the other category is not GRACE due to safety issues, and the third category is not GRACE and further information is needed. So two sunscreens, um, sunscreen components have been deemed not grace. Um, that's PABA and then trolamine salicylate. Um, these have been removed from sunscreen components and are not legally available in the United States. Um, PABA has, um, is absorbed into the blood, but it also has a high risk of, or a higher risk of photo allergy. And there are some other side of potential um, risks of side effects um, from the other component as well. There are currently 12 sunscreen components that are currently under further evaluation by the FDA given they exceed that this particular um, blood level. And so um, there's also some, some uh, concern or uh, press about um, oxybenzone. Um, this is a component that can be associated with the risk of photo allergy, meaning once the component is on your skin and you're exposed to the sun, um, some people can develop an allergic reaction to that. Um, and then in 2001, there, there was a paper that showed that when an, in an animal model, when orally taken at high levels, there could potentially be an estrogenic effect. Um, the amount of, of product or sunscreen product that you would need to apply to your skin daily is actually quite a lot to reach those, those blood levels. Um, 
importantly, further testing is underway by the FDA to further evaluate those chemicals. And so the important thing is that there are many, many ways that we have that we can protect our skin from the sun. We have sun protective clothing. We have physical blockers. There are chemical blockers with the sun as well. And so many ways um, do, that you can, you can utilize to protect your skin. We're going to definitely have to do this again in a couple of years and get an update on that. So I want to thank uh, all uh, my colleagues, Dr. Swanson and Dr. Harms, and then all the participants who have joined us today for Here Comes the Sun. I've personally found it very informative and really, as I, as I watch your sun blockers, I may have to go get some, I, they, um, or your light therapy glasses, I should say, Kelly. And then I'm thinking of the specific, I mean, Leslie, and specific sun blockers from Kelly. And Thank the participants for coming and joining us today and have a wonderful summer in the sun. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.